All right, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our Friday colloquium here at the Kinder Institute. Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Professor Levy, who is the Tomlinson Professor of Political Theory and the director of the Jan P. Lin Center at McGill University. He is also a senior fellow at both the Nixon the uh, Niskanen Center and the Institute for Humane Studies. His research is truly wide ranging, encompassing the history of political thought, contemporary normative political theory, and legal and constitutional theory. Professor Levy is the author of two monographs from Oxford University Press, The Multiculturalism of Fear, published in 2000, and Rationalism, Pluralism, and Freedom, published in 2014. In addition to articles in journals such as the American Political Science Review, Political Theory, and History of Political Thought, Professor Levy has also edited numerous volumes on colonialism, federalism, and the work of Charles Taylor. In other words, his intellectual range and depth makes him a particularly good fit for the range of interests here at Kinder. More specifically, what I've always appreciated about Professor Levy's work is both the historical depth of his political theorizing and how he employs it to both inform and complicate not just how we see, but the kinds of questions we ask about our political present. It is therefore unsurprising that his public facing writings on contemporary political questions often appear in outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Salon, the Boston Review, and the New Republic. As is our norm, Professor Levy will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, uh, which will then be followed by Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question during the Q&A, please indicate this in the chat box so I can keep a cue and call on you when the time comes. All right, Jacob, the floor is yours. It's been a year and we still don't know to unmute. Thank you very much for that warm welcome and introduction. Um, and I, I am particularly pleased to be able to, albeit virtually, uh, visit Professor Arcuda in her new academic surroundings. Um, she is among the political theorists I have admired the most for the longest and someone whose expectations I am deeply concerned to try to live up to. I'm gonna be talking today about difficulties that face the separation of powers as a constitutional doctrine and practice in the contemporary world. But as political theorists are wont to do, I start that with the history of political thought. And the particularly important transitional moment that I'm going to build up to and then uh, draw lessons from is the transitional moment from Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws, published in 1748, to the American founding uh, and the work of the American founders in such works as the Federalist Papers it, some 35 years later. Montesquieu and the Spirit of the Laws is our first source for the idea of the separation of powers as we receive it in constitutional theory today. That is a separation among canonically three powers of government, a legislature, an executive, and a judiciary, understood in some sense as constitutionally equal to one another. And a separation of powers as setting those powers uh, against one another for a specific purpose that I'm going to lay out and explain. Um, in developing the separation of powers, Montesquieu drew together different ideas from the history of political and constitutional thought before his time into a reconstruction of the English constitution of his day. Those previous ideas included, on the one hand, the ancient idea of the mixed constitution and on the other, the much more recent understanding of the rule of law protected by an independent judiciary. The mixed constitution dates to ancient Greece as an articulated and defended idea. The ancient Greeks were deeply concerned with the evaluation of different regime types understood as the rule of different classes. They're deeply concerned with contrasting and comparing democratic rule, 
ruled by the ordinary people as a class with aristocratic or oligarchic rule, understood as rule by the best, aristos means best, or simply rule by the wealthy, which were differentiated in principle, but had a way of collapsing into one another in practice. Uh, the Greek city-states were divided internally as well as divided among themselves externally between advocates of democratic and aristocratic or oligarchic rule, rule by the many or rule by the few. Now, some Greek city-states had relatively hybrid constitutional orders. And at the, uh, in the final era, in the final years of the independent Greek city-states, Aristotle, reflecting back on their experience, described the possibility of a mixed constitution that partook of rule by the many, rule by the few, and in at least some respects, rule by the one. That is democracy, aristocracy, and monarchy. Imagine there would be ways to bring those together that would capture the advantages of all and uh, make possible some greater degree of harmonious coexistence rather than the political class conflict that had so often preoccupied and divided Greek political life. That idea of the mixed constitution was picked up and carried over into Roman political thought as a flattering self-description of the Roman Republican order, which had been developed quite independently of Greek political philosophy. It had been developed as a matter of public constitutional peace settlements between the aristocratic class that had first established the Roman Republic by overthrowing the monarchy and the ordinary people among the citizenry of Rome. And the hybrid constitutional order that was the Senate and the people of Rome made up for the majority of the era that we think of as the era of the Roman Republic, made up the public conception of what the Roman constitutional order was. The many had their place in the popular assembly. The few, the descendants of Rome's aristocratic class, had their place in the Senate as an institution. And because the Romans were deeply concerned to prevent the kind of political domination that they experienced monarchy as being, they did not have a rule by one as the final piece of the puzzle, but rather rule by two. The normal condition of the uh, fast acting part of the, Republic, of the Republican constitution, the part that was able to govern military affairs and foreign affairs, was ruled by two consuls together for a one year term, able to be replaced by one dictator for a very limited one year term according to legal, fixed legal procedures, but then giving way at the end to a normal resumption of rule by two. The many, the few, and the two in place of the one. When some Romans encountered Greek political thought, they seized on this image of the mixed constitution as the best possible constitution as a way to give an account of what had gone so well in the Roman Republic that allowed Rome to be the most successful uh, political and military force in the Mediterranean world. And through that flattering self-description of the Roman constitution, of the people and Senate combined, Roman thought gave to the rest of European history an image of the Republic as the mixed constitution, combining rule by the many with rule by the few in different institutional spaces, the popular assembly and the Senate were different institutional spaces, but working together and being forced to work together for the advancement of Rome's civic interest. Now in the Middle Ages, long after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, in the Middle Ages, the monarchies of Western Europe, again, independently re rediscovered the advantages of something like this institutional form. A king needs the nobility 
to be actively involved and implicated in governance. The king needs the nobility not just to be off governing their own territories from their own castles, but to take an active cooperative part in governance at the center of the kingdom, however powerful that center is. And in some of the medieval European kingdoms, the center wasn't very powerful compared with the nobility off on their own estates. But however much the center needed to do, it needed the cooperation of the nobility to do it. And so kings would summon the nobility off their estates to occasional meetings together uh, to reach agreements about the governance of the kingdom in common. Over the course of the Middle Ages, as the commercial cities grew in importance and wealth, as a rivalrous order in the countryside to the feudally dominated countryside ruled by the nobility. Kings increasingly also wanted the cities and the residents of the cities to take part. Why? Well, in part, because it is very much easier to govern, by which I mean to tax, people who are willing and cooperative. Medieval kings didn't have remotely enough coercive power to tax their whole kingdoms violently and unconsensually. They only had enough power to tax with the agreement of those being taxed. So kings got in the habit of summoning assemblages of the nobility and assemblages of representatives of the cities to come together and agree, in the first instance, to agree to be taxed and to make their constituencies more cooperative in being taxed. And also gradually to take an active part in advising and legislating. This of course is the foundation of parliaments. It's the foundation of what we have in French history as the estates general made up of the first estate, the priesthood, the second estate, the nobility, and the third estate of the commoners, the ordinary people. Or we have in Britain as uh, two houses representing the same three organizations. The House of Lords, which is the House of Lords temporal and spiritual. That is say the bishops and archbishops as well as the nobility. That's the House of Lords. And the House of Commons as being the representatives of the um, urban and what we would now say middle-class or bourgeois commercial cities. That practice spreads across Western Europe, not because they're looking to Rome, not because they're looking to ancient Greek political thought, but for the same reason that it had developed in Rome, because governance works more smoothly when you have some degree of active participation and buy-in by the most powerful various groups in society. And because in an important sense, the nobility and the commons had shared interests within them as bodies within themselves. Nobles have shared interests with nobles, but somewhat oppositional interests between them. And so putting them in different institutional spaces, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, allows each of those institutional or class interests to be registered in a somewhat separate way. Then of course, having rediscovered this institutional form, but reading both the works of Roman self-description and the works of ancient Greek political thought, um, the medieval Europeans, including very conspicuously the medieval English, again, were happy to engage in the flattering self-description. We've rediscovered, we have a mixed constitution. We have rule by the many, the House of Commons, the few, the House of Lords, and the one, the monarchy, or the many, the third estate, the few, the second and first estate, and the one, the monarchy, reiterated over and over again across Northern and Western Europe. Now the mixed constitution is not a separation of powers constitution. Mixture is not separation. Mixture is paradigmatically combining. The effort of the mixed constitution was to get all of the different orders that it was conceived society of being made up of working together 
for the interest of the Republic in the Roman case, the kingdom in the medieval European case. Different institutional spaces do attract different institutional functions. It's not that the king and the House of Lords and the House of Commons had all the same authorities, rights, or powers. But it is the case that, as remains true in the British constitution to this day, it's true that the aspiration for what it looks like when the sovereign power of England or Britain is functioning is referred to as the king or queen in parliament. The king or queen acting in unison with both houses of parliament. That is the sovereign power as a matter of law in Great Britain. Indeed, it is the sovereign power as a matter of law where I am in Canada. Um, the queen in parliament where the queen is represented by the governor general acting in concert with the complete bicameral Canadian parliament, the sovereign power of Canada. Different institutional functions in some sense, but a very strong sense of combination and unison and an incapacity to work separately. That's the mixed constitution tradition. Independently, particularly in England, but also in some important ways in France, over the course of the later Middle Ages, there developed an ideal of the rule of law in politics. Now, law wasn't a medieval invention. The Romans were deeply preoccupied with their legal system. But in Rome, law and politics were conceived of as importantly different orders, different ways of thinking. Law governs private relations, property, contract, injury, what we would conceive of as tort law. The public constitutional standing of the Republic or the empire wasn't conceived of as law in the same way. But in medieval England and medieval France, an idea developed importantly around a limitation on the authority of the state to arrest and punish private persons. Described in the English tradition as the writ of habeas corpus, a right articulated in the Magna Carta and defended by the English judiciary against the English monarchy. What does the writ of habeas corpus mean? It means that when the king seizes me and throws me in a dungeon or the Tower of London, a judge can demand that my body be produced, my living body, I hasten to emphasize. Habeas corpus, corpus is body. Get this person's body in front of me as a judge where they can assert a claim to have their body freed. You may not lay hands on the body of a subject of a law governed kingdom and imprison them without charge or trial. Now, the development of that idea was gradual and haphazard. Um, it took a very long time. Kings are very reluctant to give up the authority to seize, imprison, and punish their enemies. But it was a steadily growing intellectual and normative idea over the course of the, early, of, of the late Middle Ages and early modernity. Combined in some cases with a claim on the part of the courts even to pass judgment on what could count as a law of the kingdom. In England, this was the right to assess whether the king in parliament could change the common law. And there was a doctrine that said statutes, that is legislation passed by parliament in, uh, with the consent of the king, legislation that changes the common law should be narrowly construed because the common law shouldn't be changed much. That is to say, judges have an interpretive authority to limit how much lawmaking happens. In France, this took the form of a remonstrance. The king would issue an edict and the courts would look at the edict, look at the existing body of French law and send a remonstrance. That is a complaint. Send a letter of complaint to the king this edict that you just announced doesn't accord with the law of the kingdom. 
And we know that your majesty could not possibly have intended to break the law. And therefore we respectfully decline to record your edict into the law books because to do so would be to disrespect you. We know you can't have meant to do this. And so we will respectfully ignore this edict you just gave us. Now, kings don't like this and kings have solutions for it. But you get the gradual emergence of an idea that the judiciary has a public role, a public role in limiting new lawmaking in ways to bring it in accordance with the whole traditional body of law. Montesquieu in the 1720s goes to England, an England after the Glorious Revolution, an England that was then uh, near a height, a historical height by that point, of parliamentary power. An England that was in the process of abandoning the language of the mixed constitution and in the process of becoming the regime of parliamentary supremacy that it is to this day. But it hadn't gotten there yet. And the language of the mixed constitution, the idea that England had the best possible constitution because it had recreated in its hybrid king in bicameral parliament form, had recreated the best of all constitutions, was still in English constitutional discourse even though in practice, the House of Commons was in the process of becoming supreme. Montesquieu studied the practice of the English constitution, uh, came to the view that the English constitution of its era had made considerable progress toward a better, freer system of government than European, other European monarchies had. And when he wrote the spirit of the laws in subsequent decades, he described England as subscribing to a separation of powers, seeing the many in the House of Commons as having a legislative capacity. Legislation initiated in the House of Commons, taxation initiated in the House of Commons. Fundamentally, the people are the authority over matters of lawmaking. Seeing in the monarchy an executive power the power to act quickly and decisively, which requires one person making decisions, this is characteristic of war and emergency, as well as the capacity to act violently, which is a necessary piece of the enforcement of the law. The executive manages, well, prisons and dungeons and guards who seize people and punish them. That's the executing the law and identifying the few, the House of Lords, as occupying one important piece of the judicial power. Why was the House of Lords a judicial power? Well, two reasons. One was the House of Lords was until very recently in British history, that is say until the last 10 years, until very recently in British history, the House of Lords was the court of highest appeal in Britain. It was extremely rare for the House of Lords to act as a court. Mostly if you appealed, you went from one judge to another judge to another judge. But the House of Lords had the legal authority to hear cases in appeal if it wished to. And remember, the House of Lords is the nobility and the bishops. It's in the late 19th century, so a century after Montesquieu's time, that the House of Lords adopts the practice of appointing a few judges to sit as a committee inside the House of Lords, the so-called law lords, to take on the business of being a professional court of appeals because the, you know, the elder sons of nobility are not necessarily trained lawyers. They are not necessarily capable of acting as a court of highest appeal. But that's a century after Montesquieu's time. In Montesquieu's time, the House of Lords does occasionally sit as the court of highest appeal. And that simply means the nobility and the priests, the bishops, sit as the court of highest appeal. Second, I said there were two, there are three. Second, the House of Lords is the only place where members of the nobility can be tried. There's a right articulated in the Magna Carta, a right to be judged by a jury of one's peers. We think of that as meaning just anyone gets to be judged by just anyone in a jury. But the peers of the nobility are the nobility. Only the nobility can sit in judgment on one another. And so the House of Lords is where criminal trials happen. 
if the defendant is a member of the nobility. Third, the House of Lords has a power of impeachment. It has the power to describe and call to account the political crimes that might be committed by the king's ministers. These, Montesquieu says, make the House of Lords, the few, into a judicial body, even though there's also an ordinary judiciary. It's really important there's an ordinary judiciary that protects the right of, right of habeas corpus. But these things together mean, what do they mean for Montesquieu? They mean that someone in England is free because they know what the law is and the law was not specially tailored to punish them. How do they know what the law is? Because it was passed by legislation, passed by a legislative power. Why wasn't it specifically tailored to them? Well, because legislation precedes judgment and execution, which will be done by different people in, a different, in two different institutions. And they know that if they comply with the law, they're safe. If I comply with the law, I cannot be arrested or punished or executed or imprisoned. That legislation happens in one institution prior to judgment, which happens in a second institution, which happens prior to execution, which happens in a third. That's how citizens can be secure, that they are not subject to arbitrary political arrest and punishment. And the capacity of the few, the judiciary, to impeach is a way that they have to punish members of the state if they should violate the rights of the people. That is the capacity of the House of Lords to act as a trial court is important to the actual effective enforcement of the separation of powers because otherwise the king's ministers could get away with things. That this was in some respects not accurate about what the English constitution looked like, that Montesquieu was engaged in some creative redescription is important, but I'm going to pass by it for the moment in order to jump ahead to the American founding. The American founding took place among a generation of people who were descended from the English, but separated from it, generally speaking, by more than a century. What the living people of 1776 or 1787 knew about the English constitution they had mostly learned from Montesquieu. They had not learned by living in England. They mostly had not themselves lived in England. There were exceptions. Thomas Paine was a recent immigrant from England, but they had mostly not lived in England. They had deeply imbibed the idea that freedom required the separation of powers. And the reason why the English constitution had been free was because it had protected the separation of powers. They complained of the military governments that were being imposed on the colonies, that they violated the separation of powers, and they complained of the corruption introduced into the British constitution by, uh, by imperialism and the British East India Company, that it tended to undermine the separation of powers. Having won their independence, they were determined to create a separation of powers. Notice the problem. Montesquieu identified a separation of powers which worked because the one, the few, and the many all had deeply different social identities. The nobility in particular, Montesquieu thought was very well aligned with the judicial power in France as well as with England because the nobility has the social standing to say no to the king. They're not afraid. They have their own sense of vanity and honor that means they will themselves submit to punishment rather than allow the king to act illegally, seizing other people and throwing them in dungeons or towers. That the nobility and the people are importantly different classes is part of what keeps the legislative and the judicial powers distinct. They don't intermix. You can't be in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, you can't be in both the first estate and or the second estate and the third estate or Parliament and the third estate. The Americans have no nobility and they have no monarch. The American idea 
that animates the constitutional engineering first in the 13 states as to become independent and write their constitutions, and then in the federal constitution written in Philadelphia in 1787, is increasingly over those 13 years, the idea that the separation of powers can be protected even though there's only the people in America, even though there are not distinct social estates or classes, simply by giving people different offices and their commitment to their institutions, to their offices, will make them jealous of their powers. In particular, members of Congress will be very protective of the authority of Congress. And therefore, they will be constantly on the lookout for abuses of executive power. There will be a natural separation between legislative power and executive power, not because there's the many and the few and the one, but just because people will be protective of their own institutions. And likewise for the relationship of the judiciary to both. If you create an independent judiciary with tenure in good behavior, which increasingly rapidly becomes understood as lifetime appointments, if you have judges appointed to lifetime terms, they will be protective of the authority of the judiciary. They will not be able to be cowed by the legislature or the executive, and they'll be on the lookout for abuses and excesses. This vision, here's a key thesis of my talk. This vision never worked. The originally imagined American constitutional order was a constitutional order without separations among the people, a whole unified people oriented toward the common good, albeit with a variety of competing interests and factions about economic interests, religious identities, and more. But we read in the Federalist Papers, there will be so many of them in the large American Republic that they will average and cancel out. And it will be as if you had one unified people acting together. There is no image at the American founding of political parties. Party is a dirty word. Party is the understanding of how it is medieval and early modern democratic republics in Europe, especially in the Italian city-states, had always collapsed. Party is how you get to civil war. And so they wrote a constitution where, for example, the rule for electing the president and vice president was the electoral college will meet, the electoral college will decide on who the best choices are, and the number one choice will become president, the number two choice will become vice president. That is to say, the runner-up in the presidential election is vice president. You can understand what that looks like in our era. Well, it came to look like that in almost immediately. In the first presidential election after George Washington's term, the runner-up was, well, the leader of a rival group. The United States had already begun to develop what come to be known as the Federalist and the Democratic Republican parties. And when John Adams, the leader of the Federalist party is elected president, Thomas Jefferson, the leader of the Democratic Republican party is elected vice president. And it doesn't work. After the nearly catastrophic election of 1800, the constitution is amended. The presidential selection mechanism is changed so that people will choose a president and vice president as one unified ticket. But that's a sign of how deeply the constitutional architects had not understood that parties would develop. What happens when parties develop? Well, when parties develop, the relationship between legislature and executive is completely transformed. If the executive, the president or governor, or, uh, because I think all of this is also true in parliamentary systems, or the prime minister. If the executive commands a partisan majority in the legislature, then the legislature is no longer going to be so concerned with protecting legislative authority that they will limit the president or the governor or the prime minister. They will by and large go along. And so the ability to uphold rule of law limits on the executive 
which depends in part on, for example, the impeachment power, which traveled from the British House of Lords to the combination of the US uh, Congressional House and then Senate that conducts the trials. The impeachment power will cease to have effective purchase. If you can't impeach the president, then the president has the ability to disregard legal and constitutional constraints on their power. Alternatively, if the legislature and the executive are not in the same partisan hands, when we have what in the United States is called divided government, you have a president of one party facing a Congress that is at least half or sometimes completely in the hands of the other party. When the opposition party controlling Congress tries to call the president to account for abuses of executive power and violations of the rule of law, from the perspective of the people, this is indistinguishable from normal partisan fighting. The effect is the same, that the difference between, well, an executive just governing and doing things that are unpopular with the opposition party and an executive acting illegally and unconstitutionally and violating the rule of law and limiting the rights of the people, that distinction becomes harder and harder to see. Relations between the executive and the legislature sometimes, in times of divided government, seem to kind of approximate the separation of powers. But that's not because members of the legislature are so proud of being in the legislature. It's because they belong to the opposition party and they have access to certain kinds of tools as leaders of a legislature to check, investigate, and sometimes punish or remove a holder of executive power. This takes somewhat different directions over the course of the 19th century in independent executive systems like the United States and in ministerial systems like Britain, Canada, and 19th century France. But in both cases, You've lost the nobility, you've lost the monarchy. You try to rebuild a separation of powers, but the separation is swamped by the critically important rise of parties. Now, parties are good. Parties, we have learned from these 200 years of experience, are actually a prerequisite to the maintenance of democratic or Republican constitutional government. Without parties, there is no organization to effectively limit the short-term ambitions of one or another office holder. There's no organization that can put forward a comprehensible platform to the electorate, allowing people to cast relatively informed votes when otherwise they would have to judge hundreds of different policy positions among dozens of different candidates. The informational cost is cripplingly large. And so people without a party system just vote for popularity. People with a party system can vote for a mission, an idea, a program, or a platform. Parties are an essential part of the system, but the American founders didn't predict that, didn't imagine it, and didn't want it. And they built a system that had a very hard time adapting to it. The result is that in both presidential and ministerial systems today, we by and large have executive authority that is very difficult to constrain either legislatively or judicially. We have presidents or prime ministers who make a figure like the attorney general, the same name of the office in both Canada and the US, a figure like the attorney general, not an officer of impartial justice, but an upholder of partisan interest. We have executives who will try to politicize the investigative and prosecutorial functions of police forces and prosecuting attorneys. And we have executives who can do all this without fear of punishment by their fellow partisans in Congress or parliament, and effectively without fear of limitation even when an opposition party is in charge, because if they are checked by an opposition party, they will go to the electorate and say, this is just partisan squabbling, pretending to be constitutional principle. 
and the electorate is not well positioned to judge and distinguish those cases. There are parts of this that uh, have been broken for a long time in ways that are gradually coming to the surface in constitutional democracies, both presidential and parliamentary. We are discovering just how far lawless and demagogic leaders can go in both presidential and ministerial systems. We're discovering that executives can arrange whole elections and systems of government to avoid criminal prosecution for themselves. We've discovered that executives can, uh, can resume torture or extrajudicial punishment or long-term imprisonment without charge of refugees or would-be immigrants without the capacity of any agency to effectively constitutionally challenge them. And we don't know, I think, what to do about it. We don't know in part because the truth of how much we need parties is at odds with the ideal of how much we need a separation of powers. While some aspects of this, I think, are probably permanent problems, and now that we've discovered them, we'll never undiscover them. Other aspects might not be. And I'm gonna close with a suggestion to think about one big direction of constitutional reform in presidential and ministerial systems alike. And that is to, uh, as much as I admire Montesquieu and as much as I'm willing to think that Montesquieu got right answers about very many things, that's a willingness to think beyond Montesquieu's canonical three-part di distinction. There might be more powers to separate than legislative, executive, and judicial. Montesquieu's vision of the executive power was a very small fraction of the states that he encountered. To us today, the vast majority of any existing government happens within what we think of as the executive branch. The executive branch in the United States is where not only the armed forces, which is the largest fraction of government employees works, it's also where the prison guards and police work. It's also where the uh, social workers who work for bureaucratic agencies like Health and Human Services work. It's where the tax collectors work. It is where very close to everyone who works for the government works in the executive branch. And critically, it is where both the elected political government, the head of party, and the high ranking party officials who make up say the cabinet work, and where investigative and law enforcement works. And I think that there's important reason to try to replicate what Montesquieu described, where rules are made in one place, implemented and enforced in another. This kind of separation into different institutional sites of a rule of law process, whereby rules are implemented only after they've been articulated somewhere else, to try to replicate that internal to what we think of as the executive branch now. To think of investigative and enforcement capacities in the criminal law, for example, as having an importantly arm's length relationship to the elected partisan executive, to have intelligence agencies and military officers having important arm's length relationships. We have some versions of this that we've evolved without thinking of them as the separation of powers. But the civilian control over the military is a separation of powers. Not only does first Congress decide the defense budget and then hand that off to the Secretary of Defense who then decides how many soldiers, how many guns, how many ships, how many planes. But then the Secretary of Defense and the President decide big strategic questions, which only then the actual holders of guns, the actual soldiers and generals, go out and implement. That is a rule of law like separation of powers like process. That we just don't admit to ourselves looks like that. 
because we're concerned to think of the executive branch as all one thing for purposes of separation of powers. I propose that in order to try to restore constitutional and rule of law limitations on executive power for the future of constitutional democracy, we ought to be looking to introduce rule of law separation of powers like mechanisms internal to what we think of as executive branch itself. I have no guarantee that this will work, but I think that we have to begin by recognizing that what we've inherited from Montesquieu through the American founders didn't ever work as envisioned and in important ways is breaking down more radically in front of our eyes. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Professor Levy. So we have um, a few questions here in the queue. Um, the first question comes from Tyron. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, give, give me one second to switch hardware. Sure. Okay, I think I'm on. Perfect. So thank you for the talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I've got two interlinked questions. The first is, how much is this just an American problem? Because um, you kind of mentioned that this is an issue in both parliamentary and presidential systems. But if anything, in the last years in the UK, the story is one of ever greater parliamentary power against the executive. I'm thinking of, for example, Theresa May being struck down with Brexit or Boris Johnson losing legal cases against him or people working across the partisan divide in order to kind of stop government overreach. So I just wonder whether this is more of an American story instead of a more general one. And then my second question is, when you're saying how we need to try and reformulate this and try and find a solution, I wonder, are we being too ambitious? Because I guess that the American system with all its flaws has lasted for, what, two and a half centuries. And it just reminds me of the quote of Rousseau when he was asked about how long his ideal government would work. And he just said, well, if even Athens and Sparta didn't last forever, how can we possibly hope to emulate them? So, yeah. Okay, uh, the first question first. <clears throat> uh, there's a growing literature in uh, empirical political science about the so-called presidentialization of prime ministerial systems around the world. As executives increasingly learn how to strategically game out their power and increasingly keeps alleged parliamentary sovereignty at bay. I think Britain is a perfectly fine case um, in fact, Boris Johnson ultimately got his way. The United Kingdom left the European Union um, using tools at his disposal, including proroguing, which is a discretionary power in the executive to send parliament home or decline to call it back again when he was at risk of losing a vote of uh, a, a critically important vote on the way to Brexit, um, including also over the course of the last several years, the development of fixed term parliaments. And this is true not only in Britain, but also in Canada. Um, executives are, executive ministers are traditionally accountable to parliamentary majorities in parliamentary systems because they have to, on an, in an ongoing way, command the confidence of a majority of the House of Commons or House of Representatives, which means typically their own party. But because it was worried that gave ministers too much ability, to, prime ministers too much ability to opportunistically call elections whenever their government was popular. They would deliberately fail a vote of confidence, go right back to the electorate and come back with a larger majority. In order to limit that, fixed term parliaments were introduced, making it impossible to, or very much harder to dissolve a parliament in the middle of a four or five year term. This, however, has meant that we see a, um, in an increasing number of parliamentary systems, prime ministers who stay in power even when they would fail a vote of confidence mm. because their terms are ongoing. And as long as they're still in power, they can go on doing stuff. I'll, I'll add to those British cases involving strategic opportunistic use of executive power vis-a-vis -vis the parliament, um, a, a case that threatened to bring down the Canadian government over the last couple of years and probably has still done Prime Minister Trudeau enough long-term damage that this will be his last term in office. Um, and that's an abuse of a relationship with the Attorney General, who in Canada, like in the US, on the one hand is supposed to be the advocate for impartial justice, and on the other hand is a partisan member of the executive cabinet. 
and Trudeau attempted to bully an attorney general out of conducting a corruption investigation in a way that uh, radically blew up. The attorney general had no power to do it. She was eventually removed from cabinet. Um, there was no way to carry forward the investigation. There's no way to actually limit the prime minister's power and parliament couldn't do it without an attorney general there to lead the investigation. Um, it looks different, obviously, in ministerial systems from how it looks in the American system. But there's, I think, increasing recognition, not only in those relatively well-functioning constitutional democracies, but in more tenuous cases, like contemporary Hungary, like contemporary Turkey, like contemporary the Philippines, uh, contemporary Brazil, a, a list that includes both ministerial and presidential systems of how much an authoritarian executive can get away with when he uses his powers to the utmost. Um, a thing lasts for a long time until it doesn't. And that we don't expect any particular system to last forever isn't, I think, reason to just shrug and say, well, if this is the thing that brings it down, then so be it. Um, when we discover strains in the system, maybe that means, well, it's a system that's lasted a long time. It will figure out some way to get to continue going on. Maybe it means this inevitably will bring it down. But in order to politically act, we kind of hope that what it means is now we're noticing a problem that we might be able to do something about. So that, that's the tenor of my reformist suggestions at the end. If this is a serious enough problem to pose a long-term threat, then we should start to be in the business of hoping that there are things that we can do about it. Thank you. I have responses, but I'm aware there's five more questions, so I'll hold off for now. All right. Um, the next question comes from William Bloss. All right. Can, can everyone hear me? All right. Great. So I guess my question is after this talk, A, is separation of power even something that can feasibly be done in modern constitutional democracies? And if it is, is it something that is necessary for those democracies to properly function? Or, or is it just a, a Rousseauian ideal that we've held on to rather dearly that may or may not be required for good government? Um. Since this is the second invocation in a row of Rousseau, I'm going to say it is not a Rousseauian idea at all. Rousseau was deeply opposed to the idea of the separation of powers. Um, he did distinguish between the sovereign government of the whole people and its agent, which is something that we might recognize as an executive government. But he did not conceive of these as co-equal in the way that Montesquieu and the American founders conceived of the legislature and the executive as standing on an equal footing of legitimacy, each checking the other. Um, so it's not a Rousseauian ideal. It is a Montesquieu and American founding ideal. The, the separation of powers is under strain and that we have learned that it doesn't always survive the strain in the face of particularly aggressive executive action. Doesn't mean that it's broken yet. And it certainly doesn't mean that in the functioning constitutional democracies uh, that it doesn't have ongoing effect across most of the landscape, even if we're discovering its breaking points at the level of high constitutional politics. So it remains the case for the most part that American citizens on American soil cannot be imprisoned without charge. For the most part, because, well, that you are an American citizen is not something that the uh, border police will necessarily believe of you. And if the border police sees you, they don't have to charge you. But ordinary police do have to charge you. They have to bring you before a judge. You can only be imprisoned in the long term for a crime if you have been arrested for violating a known promulgated law issued by a legislature and tried before an independent judge. There's strain at each of those parts. There are police forces that are increasingly politicized. There are judges who are increasingly politicized, but strain isn't yet collapse. Um, and the difference between them is tremendously important. I am not very much of an idealistic or utopian political thinker. I don't think that the difference between perfect and imperfect is the really important difference. The difference between bad and worse 
is the really important difference. And even as we see abuses of the separation of powers that are increasingly visibly bad, the difference between that and worse is still worth worrying about and trying to prevent a further slide in. Thank you very much. All right, I think the next question comes from TJ Hall. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. okay, um, so I was kind of wondering a bit about how the, the French Revolution fits into your talk, um, because at least as it seems to me, the system the French revolutionaries initially set up, um, they didn't have as much concern for the separation of powers as maybe the American revolutionaries did. Um, so I guess my question would be, do you disagree with that and would say that they did have that concern? Or if not, why were they not as responsive to arguments like Montesquieu's as the American revolutionaries were? So the uses of Montesquieu in the French Revolution is it, um, that that's a really interesting subject for research. Montesquieu was cited by French revolutionaries all the time, not quite as often by the uh, 1790s as Rousseau was. But in the earliest stages of the revolution, in 1789, 1790, Montesquieu was cited all the time. And there was a very conscious, deliberate effort to emulate a separation of powers. This was partly using Montesquieu's authority and it was partly because of the directive influence of the American revolution and at that time brand new American constitution on the thought of French figures like the Marquis de Lafayette who was a very important figure in the early stages of the uh, French revolution but had been a general in the American revolution and was close friends with people like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. There was a deliberate attempt to create a separation of powers. Um, the separation of powers that was initially envisioned could not long survive a king who was against the new constitution. Executive powers was vested in an agent who really did not believe in the whole new constitutional order that was being created. Uh, and, and that's the short answer is the initial vision for a separation of powers uh, governed monarchy ran into the fact that Louis XVI did not genuinely endorse the new constitution and was uh, conspiring to go to war against it. And in the subsequent stages of the French Revolution, uh, the need for emergency action to defend the, the revolution as it was envisioned by the more radical of the revolutionaries meant that the separation of powers was suspended as a matter of emergency policy. And so you got the Committee on Public Safety acting in effect as all three branches at once. Knowing that it was doing so and saying that it was doing so in an emergency capacity only to protect the revolution and knowing that there was a problem in that, but it was a problem that was never successfully sorted out after the collapse of the initial separation of powers regime. Thank you. All right, the next question comes from Bill Thompson. Uh, to what extent does your thesis assume a level of homogeneity within the parties that doesn't always exist? Uh, you can't, you really can't contest much if you're all a homogeneous party. You really have to have a heterogeneous party which uh, existed prior to Reagan for a great many years. Uh, and also you have a problem of a political problem now that uh, they are so homogeneous, you're out of the party if you contest. Uh, so that that's another problem with separation of powers is really political will rather than structure. Uh, the, I, I agree with everything you said until the very last bit. Okay. Um, I, I talked about the, the underlying weakness as becoming increasingly visible. Uh, that implies a change over time, and there hasn't been a change in the American Constitution to explain it. What is it that has changed? The American party system has changed. Um, the end of Jim Crow and the end of the American party system that was critically organized around an alliance between Southern white Democrats and Northern Democrats. Um, which meant that the parties were deeply ideologically heterogeneous. 
because race and region trumped ideology. Um, that era of the party system ends when Jim Crow ends. And it takes, a, it takes about two decades for that change to finally reverberate through the system. But there is a gradual consolidation of each political party as now much more ideologically homogeneous than it was for the century between the Civil War and the Civil Rights Act. Um, that consolidation is reaches its culmination in, in 1994 with the uh, Ging, it's, it's not Reagan so much as it is Newt Gingrich leading an increasingly ideologically cohesive Republican party to its first victory in the House of Representatives in decades. From 1994 until today, the United States has had more closely contested party balance than it has for any comparable period of time in its history. The parties keep trading control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency. These ideologically cohesive parties, uh, while they're not precisely even, they are close enough to even to keep changing hands. That means that there's a structural reward to having reached ideological cohesiveness. And the strange party structure that arose out of Jim Crow uh, and the Jim Crow Democratic Party in particular that made it possible for the Democratic Party to have a big national majority by combining something like economic left with Southern white uh, racial conservatives. That majority is never gonna be attainable again because the, the underlying structure of the advantage to each party of cohesiveness has now asserted itself. And because now, well, African-Americans have the vote and they can't be excluded from coalitional politics in the way that they could be up until 1965. Um, that looks like an advantage. We have better two-party competition than we used to. We have more evenly balanced parties than we used to. We have parties whose platforms make sense in a way that they didn't used to. However, we also have increasing strain on the separation of powers. We've had two impeachments, two presidential impeachments over the course of that uh, just over 25 year period of time since 1994. That's one more presidential impeachment that there had been in the whole of American history up until that time. You've had three. You had Clinton and two for- Two for Trump, Trump. two for Trump, you're exactly right. So that's two more than had happened in the whole of American history up until that time. Um, you have increasing strain about the relationship between the presidency and the FBI, the Department of Justice, uh, as well as intelligence agencies. I think that the party consolidation, you're right to point to it. What you're wrong about is to call it a problem of will, not of structure. There's a very strange anomaly in the American party system for a century. That anomaly is broken. And with the anomaly broken, we return to, well, what other constitutional democracies have in their parties, which is a kind of ideological cohesion and that reveals the cracks in the separation of powers system in ways that I don't think can be readily undone. It's not just the case that people could decide, well, I wish that we had a more heterogeneous Republican or Democratic party now. There are now structural forces in place preventing that from happening again. So it seems to me. Um, great. Uh, so just as a reminder, the people next on the queue are Connor Ewing, Tommy Bennett, um, Kiara, and Annie. Go hey. ahead, Connor. Yeah, can you hear me? You don't go here. <laughs> hey, Jacob, good to see you. Thank Hi, you Connor. for this talk. Um, uh, so my question is, is, I think is an invitation for you to elaborate a little bit uh, in what you condensed in the connection to the American founding. And so the, the question is, what is... Um, beyond representing the people. So this movement from a mixed regime to we can still have separation of powers representing the people, which you, you say didn't you know, quite cash out, seem to suggest that it happens right away or was, it was never you know, quite, quite the case. Um, beyond that, what's the purpose of the particular institutional differentiation we see uh, in the American constitutional system? And I ask by, by way of situating within 
kind of what I think are two poles of the, the contemporary debate or not debate because they're not arguing with each other, the uh, interpretations of the separation of powers. So I think of someone like Jeremy Waldron for whom um, uh, institutional articulation is really important. And so he, mm -hmm. and he grounds this in the rule of law but also kind of a maybe broader Republican purpose, which is to avoid um, arbitrary rule, right? So, you know, for him, it's really significant that a legislature has to act and then a, an executive power with redress to, to a judicial, which seems like very consistent with, with a lot of what you've said. For someone like Jeff Tulis, and so he has this new book with Nicole Mello. And so he argues that it's not, it's actually a much more decisive break. And so it's not beyond the mixed regime, it's mixed democracy, that the institutions themselves are supposed to embody certain values, certain democratic or constitutionalist values, only one of which is the rule of law, which he identifies in, in the judiciary. So there's something that's, um, uh, and how these both relate to the American founding, I think is, is much more complex than either quite Gives, gives due to it, because there's this really significant debate at the founding about essentially the old mixed regime model. So this old kind of Ganesh Sitaraman has touched on this with his middle class constitution argument. So I think you have both two poles and you have a vibrant middle that's still contesting the relevance of this old mixed regime model. So this is just an invitation to say maybe a bit more about how we get the particular institutional configuration in the American system, given what came before it. There was a lot in there, and yet I didn't quite follow the thread all the way through. Um, okay, I, I, I can give it a second shot if you want. Um, what is the purpose in the, of, of the American? Um, and I ask this but because it seems so that so much has, has changed in that, that we're projecting back into the founding a development or a role of the judiciary and of the executive um, that, that only developed and developed on, on different time scales within the United States. That's relevant to, I think, your overall assessment of whether or not it works. Um, but is it just the case that um, the separation of powers in, in the American context was an extension of this Montesquieuian? That, that, that's the purpose of the differentiation, okay. really rooted, as you say, in, in, the, in the rule of law, or is it more than that? Um, I, I, I think it really is that. And I think that while there were gestures toward doing something more in the mixed government tradition in some of the state constitutions. Um, uh, particularly you see in some of the senates of the early state constitutions, uh, an attempt to represent the few. Some of the state senates had higher property requirements to vote for Senate. Several of them had higher property requirements to serve in the Senate. Um, John Adams continued to imagine that there was that kind of mixed government element in the American constitutional tradition. And when he wrote his defense of the constitutions of the United States, we see that in his political theory. That is not the political theory of the 1787 Philadelphia constitution. And it was in the process of collapsing even in the States by 1787. It's why Adams's defense of the constitutions was uh, was received as so embarrassing by Adams's allies in that distinctive way that he had of always being just a little bit off schedule and out of sync with the times. Um, the Americans didn't believe that a slightly higher property requirement meant they had a nobility. They didn't think that their senates were, co were mappable onto the House of Lords. What did they think? Well, they came to believe that the articulation across multiple institutions even multiple institutions within a legislature served a protective rule of law capacity. You got multiple stages of review before something became a law, not because the Senate represented a different constituency from the House, but simply because the jealousy of office meant that senators would feel like they had an esprit de corps. They acted like senators. Members of the House would act like members of the House, and they would put independent judgment, getting sequentially independent judgment through two houses of Congress that got you even more of what you get out of the separation of powers. Um, I think it's, uh, it's even more straightforwardly true of the presidency. Um, there's, there's, no, there's nothing like a one in the mixed constitutional order that becomes the presidency. And as the presidency rapidly democratizes, 
from Washington to Adams to so-called Mr. Jefferson, um, from imagining the president would be called your excellency or your majesty to being called Mr. Uh, it becomes extremely clear that the president does not come from a different part of the society in the world than the society and world that elects the house. I, I, I think that the, um, the articulation across multiple institutions just is the right story for what becomes the American constitutional order starting in 1787. Tommy Bennett. Thank you so much for this very engaging and, and uh, impressive, dazzling almost uh, tour through millennia of, of constitutional theory. I, I really enjoyed it. I wanna ask a little bit about something you didn't touch on very much, which is democracy. I take Montesquieu and the, the American founders to believe the separation of powers to be necessary as a safeguard against tyranny uh, and, and, and tyranny in a, in a pretty literal sense. Uh, not just you know uh, high taxes or or over regulation, but but literal uh, domination, uh, by, uh, you know at the sword's edge. Uh, and so, to the extent we think the separation of powers still has vitality today, it's necessary only to maintain democratic majoritarian rule. I think <coughs> most people uh, believe that that's the purpose of the separation of powers. Uh, and so, to the extent in the American system at least the president is the most majoritarian branch, uh, more so than, than either House of Congress or the judiciary, uh, wouldn't creating more separation of powers uh, within the executive branch, as I take your suggestion to be, uh, in fact, be a further limitation on democracy uh, in a way that might uh, be unpalatable to people who think uh, the American constitutional order is already too undemocratic. Great, um, no, but it's really important. Uh, the, the separation of powers I think cannot be mapped onto a vision of democracy that uh, involves the untrammeled assertion of majoritarian will. Um, this is uh, to caricature only a little, this is why Rousseau was so against it because it necessarily involves constraints and subjugation. If the separation of powers is a rule of law idea, then it is not a rule of majority idea. That doesn't mean that democratic legitimacy is irrelevant, but it does mean that democratic legitimacy is always constrained. Now to that, I'll add <clears throat> that the presidency is not the most majoritarian institution, the house is. Um, it is much easier to win the presidency with a minority of votes than it is to win the House of Representatives with a minority of votes, though it's possible in either case. And the American founders expressly conceived of the House as being the most popular of the branches of government. What the presidency is, is the branch of government that can look most like one unified untrammeled will. And this is one of the reasons why uh, in constitutional democracies around the world, authoritarianism has been issuing from executive branches because the executive is the unit that has the capacity to present itself as the unified voice of a unified people, casting as enemies of the people, uh, independent bodies like the judiciary, opposition members of a legislature, members of an independent press, members of an independent academic core of the professoriate, the legal class, and so on and so on. The language of majority will, becoming the language of national will, is much easier for an executive to grab because the executive has literally only one voice, whereas a legislature looks divided. And so the authoritarian impulse is easier for the executives to capture at grave danger to the pluralistic institutions that are necessary for liberal or constitutional democracy as opposed to populist or authoritarian democracy. Um, and 
it's preventing that uh, that transition from executive power into authoritarian power that is motivating my urge that we start to disaggregate executive power as well. Uh, now, if your question is as we're just about popular opinion, if the people believe that the purpose of the whole thing is majoritarian democracy, and the people believe that the president is the tribune of the people, uh, then won't they object? Well, they might, I'm, I'm not denying any of that. But that's another way of saying the executive has the capacity to manipulate and demagogue public opinion to the advantage of the executive as an office. And that's a matter of grave concern for the ongoing stability of a rule of law governed constitutional democracy. All right, I think um, the next questions come as a cluster from Kiara and Annie. Or Annie. Hello. Okay, so Annie has this first question. Um, my first question is, is there a system there which you think does work? There's no particular system that I look at in the world and say, ah, they've got this completely stably right. Um, let's just do that. I, I think that the, the viable systems of constitutional democracy that we know are all showing related kinds of strain today. That doesn't mean that I think that they're all equally vulnerable. Um, it, it is a commonplace among political scientists that presidential systems are a little bit more prone to uh, collapse into autocracy, uh, but I, I don't think it's just a presidential problem. Um, I have a follow-up question. It's very different. Um, so basically, you were talking about how countries all around the world are, are experiencing these problems from Hungary, Brazil to America. And I was just wondering if that's the case, it seems like you, you think that that would be like an exogenous problem and not caused by all this by the internal structure, structural problems. I just, it's like a little surprising to me. And you know what I mean? And so I, I would Good. love for you to speak a little bit more on that. Yes. Um, you, 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 you can't explain a variable with a constant or a constant with a variable. Um, if it's the case that all these different systems are showing the same problem, then surely it's not actually about the systems. That's why I tried to trace out the shared ancestry of the different constitutional dem democratic systems that we've inherited. Um, it's not the case that constitutional democracy uh, as we recognize it just developed in dozens of different ways independently around the world. This transition from Montesquieu to the American Revolution and American founding, and then the transmission of those ideas back again to France at the French Revolution and the uh, post-restoration rise of parliamentary party uh, constitutional monarchy after 1815. That's one sequence of events one movement of ideas around different countries. Uh, it's why we end up with, by and large, only two big models for what this looks like. And it's the case that in both America and France, there was this early unwillingness to recognize that parties would be important. Parties evolved in the American, French, and in fact, British uh, constitutional democracies roughly simultaneously and to solve roughly similar problems. Um, so, so you're seeing variations on a common problem across the different, the slightly different branches of the same tree, rather than I think seeing one problem that just afflicts dozens or scores of different independent cases. Did, did I understand the question right? Does that yes, get it? No. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Professor. Um, the next question is from Vic Genova. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, so um, you, you spoke earlier about um, you know, the separation of powers um, specifically for the executive branch. Um, but I, I mean, you, I guess you alluded to, you know, there needs to be some sort of separation of power within that branch. So. What, I just just curious, what would that look like to you? Um, I know you said that it may or may not work, but what would that look like to you? Um, since we already have 
some systems in place, um, such as like uh, the Office of Inspector General or Freedom of Information Act or whatever. Um, these are some things that are trying to hold the executive branch um, accountable for their actions. But um, you know, what would that look like to you as far as hold, holding the executive branch a little more accountable? Good. Um, and I'm deeply worried. And there's a sense in which if I had the answer fully ready to hand, I would be out there campaigning for it, not still talking about Montesquieu. Um, but one thing that we learned is that the inspectors general are not as independent and not as powerful as we thought in the face of a presidency that is determined to overrule them, override them, ignore them, and ultimately fire them. Um, there are steps that can be taken. Um, there can be civil service protections for the employment of inspectors general. There can be congressional statutes put in place about what is required in order to remove an inspector general from office. There can be direct transmission of inspector general reports to the relevant congressional committees ordered as a matter of statute as ongoing practice rather than being subject to discretionary filtering by the elected partisan executive. Um, this is, this feels to me a little bit like whack-a-mole. Um, we recognize several precise ways that things went wrong and we can hit at these several precise ways. But part of the lesson to learn is that the executive just has so much discretionary authority and so much ability to, fit, so much as it were, time and incentive to figure out ways to work around the rules if they want to, that it's very hard. And so uh, I don't propose to enact some half dozen pieces of legislation and call it a day. And those pieces of legislation can't work in a Westminster system anyway. Uh, when you notice particular problems and particular ways that it goes wrong, uh, do what you can. And for example, uh, strengthen the protections for inspectors general and strengthen uh, the mandate that their reports be made available to Congress in a timely fashion. But that only matters if the opposition party is in control of at least one house of Congress. Um, inspectors general reports could pile up to the heart's content of the inspectors general if, they're, if the president's own party controlled both houses of Congress and Congress would just ignore them. Um, right. I, I'm still at the stage of articulating worries and trying to persuade people to share my worries. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, I think the final question that comes uh, comes from Tyron. Well, yeah, I'll ask the first question on the last one. Um, I guess again, two interlinked questions. The first is, do you see executive authority as necessarily being negative? Because I can see situations where having a strong executive is really beneficial. I was thinking, maybe this is a poor example for what happens later, but early 1920s Weimar Germany, if, that, if they didn't have executive authority, it would have collapsed with hyperinflation or a country like Belgium now could probably do with a bit more authority in their central government. So I just wonder, how do you strike the balance? I guess in your, when you understand it, are you kind of having the argument of executive authority, if in doubt, is probably bad, thus we should restrict it? And the second, and maybe a good one to end on is, would you have given this talk if Trump hadn't been elected? Like, is this a talk you could have given in 2015? Um, the answer to the second is that I, I wouldn't have necessarily paid attention. Um, the literature on the presidentialization of prime ministerial systems and the increasing what is understood to be prime ministerial office dominance over parliament in Canada and Britain, that was a literature that existed in 2015. I wasn't reading it. I'm reading it now. Um, now, I am a dual American Canadian citizen. Part of what's happened is I pay more attention to Canadian politics because I've lived in Canada an increasing number of years. And eventually I need to pay attention to the place where I live, not just the place where I'm from. Um, and it's possible that uh, Trudeau's scandal with his attorney general would have caught my attention, especially if it were happening at the same time that Boris Johnson was proroguing parliament in order to escape a vote of no confidence 
that would have interrupted Brexit. I, maybe I would have noticed. Um, it is absolutely the case that it was the Trump presidency in conjunction with the turn to populist, nationalist, authoritarian executive power in Turkey, Hungary, the Philippines, uh, to a certain extent, Israel, India, and Italy, uh, that that trend around the world caught my attention as a political thinker and focused it. Um, whether uh, Take that for what it's worth, whether that means to discount or whether it means, well, sometimes you notice problems when they come to your attention. Uh, the course of that answer, I lost track of your first question. My first question was, do you, it seems to me in your thinking, you have the stance of- Oh, is executive it, power always bad? Is executive yeah. power always bad? Um, no, executive power isn't always bad, though Weimar is such a fraught case for making this claim. Yeah. Um, it's the first one that came to mind, I don't know. Um, so I think but, I went- I think I read a piece saying that we tend to see their executive powers being very negative. However, if you trace the history, the, ch the chances are the system would have collapsed in any way, but the yes. semi-presidential system they had at least allowed it to go overcome these initial crises, even if it failed later on. So yeah, um, a bad example, which is one that was in my head. <laughs> um, I do think that the rule of law constraints of the separation of powers uh, have particular bite against the executive because it's the executive that has the police and the prisons. It's the executive that is prone to seize and punish and disappear and kill opponents of the regime without, uh, without trial. And there's a reason why Montesquieu's account of the rule of law, even in an era when executives were by our standards, very much weaker. The secret police that Louis XVI had at his capacity was nothing compared to the secret police available to a modern autocratic regime. Uh, there's a reason for the focus on executive power that we had. Uh, that doesn't mean executive power is always bad. One thing that you do want executive power for is rapid unified decision making. Um, that's why you tend to find a preponderance of executive power when it comes to foreign policy, emergency powers, and wartime powers. Uh, but the question of how to avoid having the government of a whole society be like the government of a military, the question of how to avoid having wartime powers just become powers, that's a genuinely permanent structural problem in constitutional democracy that I think legitimizes us in tending to regard the executive with more suspicion. Um, at the same time that, no, it is not always bad. We don't propose to abolish executive power. And there is certainly such a thing as legislative overreach. Um, it, it's, it's a worthy reminder, but I still think the emphasis is in the right place. I'm kind of hoping you'd come out as like an anarchist towards the end or something, but no, that's a great response. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, if you could all thank, join me in thanking Professor Levy for being here today. Um, and thank you all for being here. And mm -hmm. next week, there are two events. Um, one with Rebecca Bechtold from Wichita State and the other with Billy Coleman, who is here at the Kinder Institute here at Mizzou. Um, thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend and stay safe. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you, Professor Akuta, for 